panel on DAO tooling. So like joining me today is Juliet from Aragon. She's, uh, she's done a lot of things over her career. She's been a diplomat for Panama. Uh, she, she went on to work as a software engineer for different companies before joining blockchain. And today she's working uh, at Aragon to help developers find the right tools to, to build out DAOs uh, in a decentralized way. Um, and next we have Mark from Shipyard Software. He's the CEO of, of Shipyard Software. Bef before uh, starting work at Shipyard, he, he's done, he started a few different uh, blockchain related companies as well. Right now, one of Shipyard's main uh, products is Clipper Exchange, which is a DEX, which helps out smaller size trades, especially like where, where you might lose money on Uniswap uh, trading smaller sizes. Clipper helps you like save on both the rates as well as the gas fees. Um, Sam, Sam from uh, Superfluid. Su Superfluid helps uh, basically helps DAOs uh, optimize their finances, and manage uh, manage their cash flows, and execute them on change. But I'm I'm sure like Sam can explain it better than me. But that, that's what I understand from the site. And uh, Eyal from Deep DAO, uh, which is basically like trying to do the coin market cap of DAOs and DAO tooling. So. Um, and finally, we have John from BitDAO. Uh, BitDAO is one of the, the largest uh, DAOs in terms of like treasuries right now. And it, so it's funded by Bybit, but it's fun it functions as a DAO and uh, it's investing in different projects across, uh, like from all the way from FTX to smaller exchanges, uh, to, to smaller projects uh, through in a decentralized way. So like, uh, Let's let's get started today. So, the topic for today is DAO tooling, and like the first question I have for the panelists is like, what what has your experience been of like DAO growth and development over the last few years, and what kind of needs have you seen that DAOs uh, have have arisen for DAOs over the last few years? Like starting from the uh, the 2016 B DAO on, on, on Ethereum, which didn't go that well all the way to now, like what have you observed uh, in your personal experience? Uh, Juliet, uh, could you start? Yeah, sure. Um, so I think what's interesting about sort of programming coordination at such a scale is that you get um, interactions and even ideas from all fronts, right? And so as this starts moving forward, what we're really seeing is that we're sort of transferring that mode of we can build organizations on a bunch of different topics. And when that sort of connects with the crypto space, we're allowed to create organizations even programmatically. Um, and so what I'm really seeing across the last few years is um, the hype between the different trends that have been coming up. For example, NFT communities weren't creating DAOs at the speed that they're creating them now. Um, DeFi protocols and uh, all these different sort of play to earn. Um, these different spaces that have been uh, popping up from the need to really coordinate funds and collaborate at a scale that within their current legislations of companies uh, across the globe were thought out for people living geographically at the same within the same space. And so I think the, there's that real power in uh, the tokenomics models that we're seeing, which are changing across the board, um, as well as the different fields that these uh, DAOs are rising within. Yeah, um, Eyal, do you do you have anything uh, from from your perspective to add on that? Yeah, definitely. So uh, actually, one of our um, one one of our investors asked me today that, that camera blur is unintentional. I'm sorry about that. Um, asked me today uh, for these the, the numbers of growth over the past um, year and a half. So actually, I I know the numbers. A year and a half ago. Uh, DAOs were managing $55 million in, in their treasuries. Today, the number is, uh, I think, over $10 billion, and it reached $15 billion last month. So uh, we're talking about the growth of 300x, which is mind-blowing. In uh, terms of members, how many people had voting power in DAOs? It was about 2,000 a year and a half ago, and now it's 
close to 2 million. I think the, the last latest number on our dashboard is like 1.7 million and they're probably even more than that. So we're also talking about hundreds of uh, X of growth in, in a year and a half, which is astounding. And um, just to talk about uh, tools in, in ver on a very general level, I think the two top categories for tools for DAOs right now are tools for organizations, for example, managing money, uh, managing governance, and then tools for people, which is something like um, like reputation tools and uh, and uh, like a personal dashboard for DAOs, which is something that uh, we're building in deep DAO. And, and so um, overall, I think uh, a way to look at DAOs right now would be to look at them as uh, as a mesh network of uh, organizations and people in a way that never existed before. Never, never before people and organizations had such a fluid structure of, uh, of flowing from one, one organization to another and having organizations employ uh, similar people. Yeah, uh, um, Sam. If that's, so, if that's so, a little bit abstract, uh, I'm sorry if that's a little bit of abstract, uh, yeah. but I've been doing this for uh, pretty much every day. So it feels natural to me. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. That's fine, y'all. Um, Sam, so so like as um like working at Superfluid, you you must see a lot of uh how like DAOs manage their finances firsthand. Could you could you like talk a bit about the differences you've seen? Because like like publicly we see all the their DAOs that like Constitution DAO, they're raising money to try to buy a copy of the Constitution, uh, and all the way like to bid DAO, which is like trying to do a a VC fund uh, as a DAO. So have you seen firsthand like what are the differences in how they manage their finances and like uh, what problems arise that uh, different tools are solving for that? Yeah, so it's super fluid. What we deal with most is helping DAOs to pay their contributors. Um, that That's mostly what I'm connected to. Yeah. Um, and we've seen a lot of growth there in tooling and, and good ways to do that. And there are even things being built on the reputation management side and on the people management side that we think is really, really important, just as infrastructure for building these kind of fluid DAO teams, right? In terms of larger um, management of treasuries and things like that, I think Gnosis Safe is, is used pretty much across the board by the majority of DAOs that I've seen and I've worked with. Um, and I think things related to just actually sending and transferring funds um, and managing funds, I think we're seeing some of these things pop up. There are definitely players in the space that care a lot about it. Um, in terms of in terms of getting to like really, really high quality, in-depth financial management, right? From the treasury point of view, I think there's more that can be done, right? There's probably more on the um, the overall capital management side, being able to really easily manage. The, the finances of your down in a way that can show you what your returns are, right? Similar to what like an endowment fund mm. or a traditional fund would have in terms of tracking their overall uh, financial performance, because there are so many places you can put your money as a DAO to actually grow it in, the, in, our, in our world. So I think that there's a lot that still needs to be built. Um, there are things that make it easy for sending funds and, and, and managing things from a high level point of view. And we do a lot for helping DAOs pay contributors, but like I said, there's still a lot of room for growth. Yeah. So like what you said, like it makes me think of a few different tracks to go down, uh, Sam. Like one um, one thing I was thinking of is like multi-chain uh, DAOs. So, so, so like I, I myself, I've joined a few like Solana projects as well as like Ethereum, uh, EVM, uh, ETC chain DAOs. Um, but the, the tools that are involved in both are very different so so like uh i i have like two questions one for john which is more on the capital management side like what have you seen from your experience in in bit dow uh and how how do you do you use any tools if any uh f for managing the treasury in bit dow right now and for mark like what what do you see in the multi-chain or, or like cross-chain just cross-chain uh applications for like DAO tooling in, in like managing finances. So, so uh, I guess we can start with John, if, if that's okay. 
Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I think um, a lot to unpack there, like uh, for, for BitDAO, I mean, it's, you know, not some revolutionary technology just because there's two and a half billion dollars doesn't mean that it's any different kind of like a multi-sig. So I'd say it's, it's pretty standard approach there. Although obviously a few more considerations than maybe like a smaller kind of investment fund. Um, and I think it's also important to note that like the structure of BitDAO is that, you know, two to $5 million from Bybit is going into BitDAO every day. There's already around two and a half billion dollars in the treasury. So being a simple like venture DAO, it would be challenging to allocate that in a meaningful way. Like, you know, BitDAO holders would have to vote on thousands of different investments. So kind of the notion is to create these autonomous entities below BitDAO, um, kind of help them set the mandate, get really kind of like competent, capable subject matter experts in like gaming or privacy or DeFi and really like let them set up these sub DAOs that, that can kind of allocate uh, that capital to the periphery. Because I think like keeping kind of like this one large massive entity and trying to have it, you know, hold all the funds and allocate all the funds and manage all the funds is just extremely inefficient. It's very hard to kind of make those decisions. But if you have this kind of fractal growth of kind of autonomous entities below that and then even more ent- uh, you know, DAOs below that, um, I think the further you get to the periphery, the further you get into people who are very plugged into certain domains, the, the more efficient it is to handle that. And so, you know, the way that we handle risk for that is by having this multi-sig really just focus on the mandate. And then if they meet their mandate, it does periodic kind of top-ups every like three, six or 12 months, um, whatever the agreement is with that kind of sub-autonomous entity. I see. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Like the sub-DAOs, like with domain experts, I say in uh, NFTs or GameFi or, or DeFi or anything else, uh, managing those sub-DAOs and then uh, just them meeting their mandates just like with a, you just you just use a multi sig uh, wallet to so so that all the parties approve different transfers. Uh, um, th- that that's how you're solving that problem right now. Yeah, so it's basically um you know we have a team who manages the multi sig and then they basically yeah. uh, are governed by the BitDAO token holders votes. Um, so we'll have like okay. a soft proposal, then a snapshot vote, and then the multi sig will facilitate whatever okay. the, the token holders decide. I see. I see. Um, yeah. So, uh, Mark, um, do like on my question earlier, like for do you, what what kind of problems or what kind of challenges do you see, especially like for like cross chain um, liquidity of, of like let's say I I I want to invest. I'm a Solana DAO and want I want to invest in uh, different e- ETH projects. So, so do you, do you, have you seen these kind of use cases come up uh, and is, is that a significant problem or not really? I don't think it's a significant problem today uh, yeah. for the reason that um, the tooling to do that on some sort of an automated or permissionless basis doesn't quite exist yet. And so the way that DAOs are solving it is the same way they've solved these problems for the past several years when tooling doesn't exist, which is... Uh, you know, they have some sort of multi-sig, there's some sort of off-chain component and like that handles the problem, you know, and, and people who represent the DAO uh, or who are involved in the DAO will, um, you know, will, will kind of, if they need to move assets cross-chain, like they'll do something like that and yeah. it mostly works. Um, but the thing I've seen most over time, I think is just the, the growth in individuals who are involved in this, to AL's point, and the assets that are involved in this, uh, to AL's point. And also, I mean, I think John is a great case in point where BitDAO has billions of dollars. And what you see with just the like exponential growth in people involved, A, it creates a market for tooling to exist, right? So Sam starts a company that serves these DAOs and serves individuals. And now there's a market for him to like express his entrepreneurial energies. So we're seeing more tooling, which is amazing. What I think we see here uh, that you know is a little different than the traditional economy where you just have people involved in entities. And of course, there's all sorts of tooling for entities um, is that the more people get into the DAO space, the more people are also contributing to governance and uh, more, more have ownership and the more contributing to tooling. And so there's kind of like this extra exponential kick that the more people that get involved the more stuff happens because it's so participatory and that's like super interesting and why like i feel like we're seeing a hockey stick in uh you know in in dow growth uh now uh in both tooling and you know every metric imaginable 
Yeah. So, um, Julie, at, at Aragon, you're, you're building like basically a governance tool for, for DAOs. And I, I think I, it's Gnosis Safe, which uh, Sam mentioned earlier. I, I think that's one of your like biggest competitors in, in the DAO governance tool space. Like, what, what, what do you think of um, like all the previous comments so far? And how, how does, um, how, how does Aragon uh, offer? How, how does Aragon's offer differ from, let's say, Gnosis Safe or, or any other um, competitors? Yeah, I love that question. And I actually refer back to what Mark just mentioned because I think he nailed it in talking about that collaborative approach. Um, the way I think of it is that we're really working at like Wagami speed, right? Which is we're not doing a competitive advantage, but we're really taking a collaborative advantage over um, previous work. And so thinking through that uh, mindset, currently, you're right that I think a lot of uh, DAOs are using a multi-sig approach with Noxysafe, with Noxysafe, probably also a voting approach with maybe um, some different tooling. But what we're offering is more of like a one-stop shop approach where you say create DAO, add some parameters, and you know, in a span of five minutes, you can have your DAO working entirely upon uh, funding, voting, um, and a lot of different sort of smart contact, smart contract, even custom integrations that you can add on um, to your platform. And so we have sort of a backend aspect of the smart contracts that we've provided, as well as a front end sort of client side so that people have a UI to integrate when it comes to DAO, uh, treasury management, voting, um, funding, et cetera, token creation. And and uh, aside from different features, so so like I have a like follow up question on that. Like, is all of that done off chain or on chain? And uh, because like if it's on chain, especially I I think there's a lot of like uh, transaction costs involved with that as well. Yeah, Although, that's actually okay, a yeah. Yeah, you'll go, go no, ahead, no, go ahead. Yeah. You're right. That's actually a great question. Um, so I think traditionally we've been working entirely on chain um, and mostly on Ethereum, which was causing, like you've just mentioned, big cause for our users. Um, and so what we've done in the past few months is that we've actually been working on the bridging to different chains. So now we're in Polygon, we're in Harmony. Um, we have a roadmap of uh, bridging into different um to different chains and so that's how we've sort of been managing that aspect of the transaction to lower costs so okay uh, i have a question like open to everyone um right now i think a lot of the innovation in dao governance has still been based on ethereum uh, the ethereum chain there are DAOs across all all different chains but the it, the, the the thought that goes into dao governance is still uh I, I find it most developed in the Ethereum chain. Uh, yeah, but some of the earliest DAOs are, are there. And even today, like the age of like DAO governance is still mainly Ethereum. Although uh, let's say like Solana, there are a few examples as well. So like how do, do you see it as uh, still being Ethereum dominated or, or are there any like kind of L1 or alternative L1 or L2 alternatives that, that you see right now. So like I'm opening this up to everyone. If you if you have a, I, I can I can uh, say a couple of words on this. Yeah. Uh, definitely, there's uh, all the substrate ecosystem, the Polkadot and Kusama, are DAOs in themselves. So there are a lot of DAOs, a lot of organizations that are built like a DAO on the substrate uh, in in the substrate ecosystem. And um, they have a they have a kind of a different uh, innovation uh, that that echoes um, echoes real life democracies. They have a something they call democracy, which is the entire token holders, and then there's a council which is voted on by the token holders and has um, uh, a, another set of uh, jurisdiction over the voters over over the treasury. And then there is a committee for fast action, which is like, um, okay, we need to fix something now and we cannot wait for the entire token holder population to, uh, to do something. So we're uh, running a fast uh, proposal process. And, and that's another um, approach uh, for governance that is different than many of the Ethereum, uh, Ethereum uh, DAOs. And there's also um, Sputnik DAO, 
or, or I think they have a new name now, maybe Rocket DAO um, on the near ecosystem. So there's more uh, DAOs coming up uh, from that angle, that uh, chain. And uh, there's a framework to run DAOs on BSC. And we see new DAO launchers and DAO frameworks uh, coming up every day. Um, so the on-chain uh, DAO ecosystem is, is very much uh, alive in other chains as well. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, yeah. Like, does anyone have uh, anything to add on that? Like, have you seen any kind of activity like on non uh, non ETH chains, um, Sam or Mark? Like, anything really on that? Yeah, in in my case, um, I'm much more familiar with EVM compatible side chains yeah. and Ethereum layer twos. And I do think that there's definitely interest in deploying your DAO on one of those layer twos or side chains. So there's interest there. Yeah. Um, we actually, so, so Juliet and the Aragon team have actually been doing a really good job of embracing this, right? They've been getting a lot of growth on DAOs launching on Polygon um, to, the po to the extent where, you know, a lot of our volume is actually on Polygon. That's actually the majority of our volume for Superfluid. Um, so like the, the growth was so big within the Aragon ecosystem on Polygon that we just co-sponsored like multiple bounties um, in, in, a, in a hackathon that the Aragon team just put together, right? And we wanted to help um, create super fluid based integrations with the Aragon client at that event um, just because we saw the growth was, was so large there. Um, so I'm definitely bullish on that as a trend. I'm less familiar with other chains um, but I, I can say that there's interest with uh, EVM compatible things. So, oh, interesting. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It's I, I guess it's a lot more transferable, like from Ethereum to the EVM compatible chains. Um, yeah, yeah, it is tricky though. Yeah. It's tricky because you know it's if you launch like like Compound is, if I had to guess, it's it's going to be pretty tough for them to move everything to an L2, like that, that's a tricky problem for, for larger DAOs to figure out because I think a lot of people still have the mindset the, that the, the most secure place to have that much money and, and, and that many important things is on Ethereum mainnet, at least for yeah. the foreseeable future. But I think for new DAOs launching, I think they're looking at, at other options more often. So. I think it also, if I can add a bit there, I think it also falls into a bit of a race between sort of the alternative blockchains, the L2s and like the ETH2 side. So, you know, the more that, for example, say Solana gains traction, that's amazing. But unless it becomes like the mainstream de facto choice for a lot of the projects, the moment that ETH2 catches up, sort of L2s can, you know, disappear and then Ethereum will just keep on kicking it. And so from what I'm seeing is that it's a bit of a race on like who will sort of gain a bigger adoption um, faster and when will ETH2 actually be sort of deployed. Mm hmm. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And I think another thing to consider is a lot of the tooling and a lot of the like the smart contracts that have been used and battle tested have been deployed on Ethereum, right? They're they're not they're not Rust programs, they're they've been Ethereum contracts. And I could be wrong, maybe the Solana ecosystem and the the Polkadot and Kusami ecosystems are doing a really good job in building their own toolings. But you know, in, in my experience, some of the the longer lasting things and tools that have been out in the wild for a while have been EVM compatible, so. Yeah, yeah um, like, um, I, I would say though that, that your question brings up a really good point, which is a lot of times we think of uh, DAO as an Ethereum DAO or a Polygon DAO or, or something, but, but that's not really the case, right? The chain is just the tooling for the, the organization and the group of people. Ultimately, you have a DAO. And one thing that uh, is good tooling for a DAO is a chain so that you can have on-chain voting. Um, but you could switch and, uh, and, and there will be tooling that probably helps people switch. Um, ultimately, it's about the DAO more than the chain. And so regardless of what chain wins, I think the successful DAOs will be fine. Uh, and if they need to move, they'll figure out how to move. Um, or they won't have to because the DAO is what engages the people rather than the chain itself. 
Yeah, yeah it definitely, becomes yeah. The, the chain. The chain really is just part of what the DAO is. There is a big component that is done off chain on chat channels and, and uh, forums like Discord and Discourse. So, uh, which is really uh, how people um, operate. We do a lot of chatting, we do a lot of talking, we debate things, and we don't bring something to a vote uh, every 10 minutes. Uh, we do some, some, uh, some discussion first, which I think is, is a very important uh, tool for DAOs, just like it is for communities. Very much so. I mean, DAOs, a lot of times we think of them as these entirely autonomous on-chain things, right? But but the reality is, you know, that's just the tip of the iceberg. Most of everything happens off-chain and maybe the chain solidifies things, right? If a, if a debate is happening on-chain, that's probably not a great use of the chain. Uh, right. But it is a good use of locking something in and kind of confirming final agreement in, let's say, a vote uh, for a specific proposal that's been heavily debated and hashed through elsewhere. Yeah, it, it's a great way to um, to um, have a, a clear history, and it's a great tool for transparency. So you know, once something is locked in, like, like you said, Mark, you know what happened. You know who voted for, who voted against, what was the result, and what was the decision about. And you have a history of decisions, which I think is... Um, to me, it's revolutionary, this level of transparency into a project uh, this big. And it's a huge step forward in how communities manage themselves. Yeah, well, and just to like add on to that, I mean, I think it's it's interesting because, you know, I, people like to act like DAOs are binary, right? Like it's either decentralized and autonomous or it's like not, but that has not been the case in my experience. I'm sure there's arguments for and against and like, but then nor are they static. Like, I think what you start out as can be very different because there's this notion of like liquid participation and people get busy and maybe they're in three DAOs and like life happens, right? And so I think it's like that intersection of setting a mandate and being able to progress on that, but also allowing as many people to participate as possible. But how you define your community, like how decisions actually get made, there's like a wide spectrum of what that can look like. Um, and I think it's, kind of interesting because it's like the blockchain piece is really that settlement layer you know i think there's some conversation around like what that should look like but in, in my opinion i think from the, the fundamental tech st uh, standpoint like it should be as decentralized as trustless as possible like that's kind of like the bottom line like that's very important but i think when you have these like layers stacked on top of that of which DAOs very much are you, you can have kind of different levels of abstraction for governance and how decisions are made so you know, if you have maybe like one person who's like this benevolent dictator, right? And then like they can be replaced by token holders or if you maybe have all the token holders and more of a direct democracy, like I, I think that those are kind of the bounds and anywhere in between that, it, it could make sense. It just depends on what you want to do. So I would just love to see more experiments. Like I think staying away from this whole, like, hey, you're not a DAO or you are a DAO. Um, I think there's a lot of room to experiment there and see what works based on what you want to do. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's something that we've thought about uh, a lot in the beginning. What is a DAO? And there was a wave of purists who said, this is a DAO and this is not a DAO. And quite early, we realized that um, we love all DAOs. If people are doing things together and manage assets together, then they're a DAO. And um, it's really important to have tools to understand the DAOs from the inside. So just like you said, um, it's not like, uh, it's not binary. It's not either Europe. Uh, decentralized or you're centralized. A DAO can have um, uh, a unique and, and uh, its own power structure. And it could be nuanced and it could, be ch could change over time from uh, the power being held by two people or one, one person to the power being held by 50 people or, or even more than that, uh, really distributed among thousands of people. And um, this is one reason, this is one thing that we're doing at DeepDA, we're analyzing the power structure and we're, we're showing how uh, power is distributed. Yeah, so, yeah so I like, love that. Go, yeah, go, no, go, go ahead, Julian, go, go ahead. No, I was actually going to refer back uh, to grabbing onto that comment from AL back to your first question on like, where, where are we seeing the DAO ecosystem and where it's headed? And I think he nailed it in like, 
were experimenting. And right now it's a beautiful time for, you know, rethinking through how we've been coordinating and collaborating over time. And we've been sort of crafting everyone within this space, our own taxonomy, our own best practices, our own sort of internal experiments that then potentially we share as we're learning in public and we share with that from that collaborative approach. And so that's where the speed is so, so exponential because we're all sort of tapping onto each other, but really no one knows, right? And, and that's where the potential for hackathons like this and projects to keep rising um, really adds on a booster to the ecosystem because it allows for the tooling created for the problems that people are seeing across the board and get some funding to kick off uh, those projects. Yeah, so so like, I think this whole discussion, uh, it brings, yeah, it makes me think of another question, which is like, you see so many different DAO governance structures. There, there's like the, the Moloch DAO structure where uh, they have the, the whole idea of rage quitting. That's part of the whole Moloch DAO concept, but I'm, I'm part of a lot of NFTs and they call themselves DAOs, uh, but they're not that decentralized. They're still a core team. And then they come up with proposals for the the holders to vote on. But it's basically like you you know beforehand like which outcome they prefer. And and then that's what they want you to vote. That's what they want you to vote for. Uh, and all the way like in, on Ethereum itself, there's a lot of discussion on like things like quadratic voting and how, how to limit the power of like whales to uh, steer the, the vote a certain way. So it's so like out of all these different DAO governance structures, are, are there, is there any kind of, um, is there even a need for a common tool or, or like each of them, do, do, you, do you see like all of them like developing tools that only like some, some that I've seen, they just have a Discord vote and then they, they just go by that, like how many people click the emoji and, and that's enough for them. They, they, don't, they don't need a, an on-chain kind of, uh, they don't really even, they debate it on, on the Discord channel, um, but uh, that's it. They, they discuss it on Discord, people vote and then the team implements whatever it is. Um, but so, some, some are much more elaborate. They have like, like discourse channels where everyone outlines their, their points and, and they try to uh, argue the pro, pros and cons and it's actually a much more vibrant debate. So like, I'm sure like all of you have seen different variations of that. Um, like, do you, do you see any problems personally that you think could be things that could, could be worked on? Or it's really up to the DAO themselves to decide what to do. So, uh, John, I saw, I see you unmute yourself. Do you have anything? Yeah. 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 I mean, like, um, talk to a lot of different projects. I mean, so like, this is like the, the DAO tooling space, I think is quite yeah. interesting to me because I think there's a, a lot of shortcomings here. Like, you know, like yeah. being on Telegram and Discord and even Discourse, like, this is super web too clunky that we're trying to shoehorn into this yeah. new model. And so it's like, there's a ton of innovation that needs to like be it to happen here. So, I think to like kind of break it down into a couple different pieces, there's like the voting piece that you mentioned. Um, you know, we all use snapshot, like that, that's fine. But I think one is like, how do you get better engagement? Um, you know, I, I would love for everyone to be actively participating and for us to get to the point where it's like, okay, we need quadratic voting because everyone's like so passionate. But I think most of us who've been in DAOs have realized that for certain initiatives or maybe for most initiatives, it's just a few people, right? And so I think like allowing that space for people to kind of talk, but how do you improve that dialogue? How do you get people to talk more? Which um, kind of like, and then I think there's also like, there could be some striation between kind of votes. Like, do you need a full snapshot vote? Like, what if you just had some signaling votes? Like, what if you have like a massive a community? What if you could actually identify people and be like, oh, this person's very technical or this person's more community oriented or this person has this kind of expertise. We should probably give them more weighting. So I think like some differentiation between, hey, just everyone vote now or like everyone just kind of talk in discord and it's like, super kind of uh, busy and like that gets down to the communication where I think asynchronous communication is really good for something like this you know something more reddit style where people can vote and upvote where it's like if you're in a, in a DAO and discord with like you know more than 150 people I think is kind of what I've noticed is it gets so busy there's just so many messages I log on I have a thousand updates I, I can't possibly read that or, or keep up with that so I think like something that's asynchronous um, that, you know, uh, it is also a component of like if you're an extrovert or you're an extro or introvert, right? Like how you engage with these communities. Um, and then I think like really like that culture uh, aspect of like, how do you allow people to easily go in and out 
kind of like of this and like participate. Um, you know, there's a few projects like uh, with this notion of like a wiki, right? Where you can easily get spun up on the history and like get that context because what you want is this open platform where people can come in, get spun up very quickly and, and participate. But it's like, how do you really get that if, oh, I'm supposed to scroll through 10,000 messages in Discord, I'm supposed to read through all the 50 votes that you did. It's like, what if we kind of had some history and then incentivize people to keep that kind of current? Um, and that's how you can quickly kind of get like the ethos of the DAO or kind of like, what are some of the highlights, priorities and context around it? So um, yeah, I mean, I, I, if you want DAO, DAO tools forever, but it's like, I think like those are some of the biggest pieces there is like just that communication piece is just really bad right now. Um, I think there's like the number one thing that I see getting pitched because it's like, that's obvious. I think some of the nuanced voting stuff that also plugs into the identity is like kind of like a second order that I would love to see innovation on. And third, that I think is like a black hole is just like that culture. Like how do you kind of get that like active engagement from a community and how do you kind of like help steer direct it based on some decisions and, uh, and community engagement from the past? Um, but yeah, anyway, I'll, I'll stop there, but it's like, there's like a ton that could be done for sure. You know, what, one thought on that are the parallels between the problems you've mentioned and the problems we've had for thousands of years in uh, democratic governance <laughs> and governance of all kinds. And I, and we haven't solved them, right? There is no actual solution to that problem, right? There is no way to be a fully informed voter. Uh, there are forms of democratic governance which can help with that, representation, et cetera. But ultimately, it's just like a, a journey and we'll just keep getting better and better at stuff like that. But, but there is no end state solution. Um, and that then democracy is a little messy. Yeah, yeah. I, I, agree no. with both, okay. I agree with both of you. And, and I think, um, especially with you, John, um, I, I agree with everything you said. And, and I think that uh, it's exactly the opposite. Participation is amazing. Um, when you look at the um, at the DAO with a thousand people and you have two percent participation, you're talking about people voting on a on sometimes a daily basis. Uh, people getting involved in decisions, uh, in in many decisions uh, over a long period of time, over and over. And if you can compare to uh, to existing democracies, like Mark said. Uh, participation in DAOs is, is very high. And it's actually, uh, you know, who are we competing with? We're competing with democracies who have uh, declining participation for a long time now, in the West at least. And we're, or we're comp competing with a Facebook uh, group that everybody's fighting with everybody. Nobody agrees on anything and nobody makes decisions together. So uh, in DAOs, you actually have a lot of people making decisions and, and uh, these decisions count. And I think um, to what Mark said about informed voters. Um, so again, transparency allows the DAO ecosystem um, to have more data and allow more people to be informed on, on what's going on. And both in terms of the content of, of decisions and in, uh, again, the power structure of, of the group. So that's an incentive for people to participate. If you know, uh, the stakes and you know who's for and who's against and your chances of being successful, the chance of you being uh, a participant goes up. So that's one thing that, that I think is um, important for uh, the current DAO communities. And the other thing is that this is an ownership economy. You're actually a part of that DAO, you own part of the DAO. And so it's another incentive for you to actually go and do something. Um, and the fact that, again, you can vote uh, three times a week sometime using your stake in the DAO to do a snapshot vote or, or a compound governance vote or any kind of vote. So uh, again, there's, there's, um, this is the crypto way of uh, incentivizing, um, incentivizing participation. You actually own part of the DAO. Yeah, and I think that's a super interesting point because it brings me back to sort of this overarching umbrella of membership, right? What does it mean to be a member within a DAO? How do you turn participants from lurkers to active contributors? How do we manage those contributors? How do we track their progress, incentivize, you know, that intrapreneurship and that um, collaboration within the DAO while also be able to track complexity and, and reward them thoroughly? And so these are all problems, and I love what Mark said, right? That go back to infinity of time. 
Um, but really that when we try adding on some technical tooling to it, the technical tooling is great, but it's still sort of a, a human issue, right? And how are we sort of balancing um, that, I think is a super interesting, a super interesting take and a problem that from what I've seen, for example, from the previous uh, DAO global hackathon that we just ran, um, a lot of people are trying to solve and, and it, it goes back to that sort of rabbit hole from time to time again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. And I think one thing that the technology does enable though is the ability to iterate more quickly on governance than we've ever been able to do in the history of our species basically right so all of the best practices we have with democracy with different forms of governance these are things that have been um not necessarily easy to iterate on unless you want to start wars and and have lots of infighting um it's not necessarily an easy thing to, to iterate on governance in the actual world it's tough to um, have revolutions and, and and try new things out right I think what we have is a lot of small groups creating their own versions of internal governance and, and community management. And I think that the, the ability to iterate way faster on this is going to result in probably new knowledge that can be carried into running businesses that don't, that don't ever touch blockchains to influencing governments and also making our space within DAOs better too. Um, one thing I do want to bring back up actually is John's point on and I guess, Juliet, you made this point as well on how do you how do you think about this onboarding process for people outside of your community to come in and become a contributor? I think that is probably the biggest unsolved problem right now in in the space. Right. If I go drop into any discord, the first thing I want to know is, OK, you know, we mentioned the wiki. Right. What What's the context here? Right. What is this DAO all about? Um, how can I get involved? Is there any technical knowledge I need if I want to be a developer? Um, is there any knowledge I need to know about the community if I want to just contribute like from a marketing point of view? What can I do to actually get involved and use my skill set to help here? I think you know, that's still a wide open question. There are definitely tools that I think can help with that. There's software we can write, but this is going to be like a process and best practices problem on the human level more than it's going to be a one tool to fix everything um, kind of situation. So I'm looking forward to continued experimentation with that. I think some DAOs out there do a very good job. I don't know if you guys are familiar with the DAO called Index Coop, but I think Index Coop does an excellent job with a working groups model to um, make it very clear how, to, how people can get involved. There's a track you can go down when you first enter the DAO. There's a very clear page in Notion you can read. And if you, if you follow their guide, and you get involved in the different working groups, you can actually have an impact. And it's, it's actually pretty clear as to how you can do that. Um, but I think things like that, processes like that, I think need to be experimented on more. Um, and we can't just set up these Discord servers and expect people to come and, and know what to do, right? I think sometimes there's, there's a benefit in having some friction, right? I think people that are willing to go through the friction and actually contribute and have that initiative, that's a high, you know, that, that's a way to find high signal people. But I think we could all do a collective better job. I agree. Uh, I would, I would say though that the tooling may not necessarily be the answer there, right? If we if we go back to how political parties do it, uh, it's often one on one human relationships. Right, like how do you get someone up to speed? One way is to give them all the materials. Another is to mentor them and give them a mentor, uh, and create these, uh, you know, processes so that so that individuals pull other individuals forward, uh, because ultimately, like that, that tends to build emotional investment and work, um, and uh, and that's worked in political parties for a very long time. Yeah, 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 I'm with you. I, I think it's it's mostly a human process problem and and, and human problem more so than a tooling problem. I agree. Percent. Yeah, and then I was just gonna say, yeah, I, mean, I agree. Like, I think what Mark said resonates. Is like, you know, look out look through history, right? Like, I think crypto likes to kind of take things and build it and act like it's entirely new. But it's like, you know, I think especially for DAOs and for governance, there's like, like you said, thousands of years of kind of history for this. And some things I think can be shortcutted. Like, I think. You know, having to ride on a horse to like put your paper ballot, you know, like, you know, and like have a, 
have a dialogue with no digital communication, like obviously things have iterated and changed. So I think like plugging in these tools and seeing what we can make more efficient and better, and then check those assumptions about how governance has played out, like given this kind of like new innovations, it, it is good. But I think it is interesting how we start to trend toward a lot of the things we're familiar with. And like, whether that's because, hey, we're familiar with it, we just trend toward that because we get it, or because this is objectively probably a good way of organizing the way that things get done. Um, I, I think it's like a healthy endeavor to like explore that. Um, and I think it always comes back to those experiments, you know, like try it, you know, see what, see what happens, see what works, see what doesn't. And I think that's very much the phase that we're in right now. Um, it'll be interesting to see how it plays out over the next couple of years. So, okay. Um, yeah, yeah like, th thanks for all your comments. Like, so in the end, like a lot of times it's really a human problem and it's really up to the community and the team that start building it on how they want to structure structure the DAO. So, so that's, that's what like I'm getting from all your comments and that's what I observe as well, like in my own experience, like how different communities, they, are they on the centralization to decentralization scale? Where do they want to sit exactly? How much community participation do they actually want? Um, but, but yeah, like I, I think like John made a good point about asynchronous communications. Sometimes like Telegram and Discord, it really gets uh, it's, yeah, it's quite overwhelming. And I just like took, took a quick look at uh, index, index cool. It looks, yeah, it looks very well organized. Um, they have all the, the Git book and everything on how, how you can get started, which a lot of DAOs right there, right, right now, they don't really have uh, anything similar going on. Uh, yeah, like you, you can get involved by being a holder and then joining the the discussions but not uh they're not as like beginner friendly you you have to like sit, get into a discord uh, and then just like absorb things before you really get get started mm -hmm. but, but index group se seems to make it clear for everyone uh how you can get started as a as a newbie uh and, and get involved in the community so so but like going back to John's earlier point, this is all these are, are like still bridging like web two tools back to web three. Is there any, any need for let's say like a, a decentralized like a mirror, like as as mirror is to Medium or Twitter? Is there uh do you, do you see a need for a web three version of let's say all these Git books and Notion documents? Um, yeah, they're opening this up to everyone. Could you repeat the question? So, so like, do you see as um, like mirror, mirror.xyz, they're basically trying to do a medium uh, or, or like yeah, a medium or substack, but on in a decentralized way. So, so like, do you see uh, a need for, let's say, a, a decentralized notion or Git book for uh, these are still web two tools? Is, is there a need for like some kind of model or, or is it more of like a human? problem where the team has to decide how they want to organize things exactly uh, and and just like build a community around that yeah I, I think from what i'm seeing is that there are sort of two different tracks on that question one of them is decentralized tooling that's sort of uh, like a web3 version of web2 tools so for example you mentioned notion i know clarity is a decentralized version of that um, just like uh, Mirror would be sort of a decentralized version or like Web3 version of um, Medium. But I think going further uh, than just the tooling per se, it's interesting to think of the different functionalities that would be needed for, for example, a project management tool for a Web3 project. And so some of the discussions we've been even roaming around throughout this panel are, you know, how can we track contributors? How can we reward them? How can we turn them, uh, create sort of a documentation when they're onboarded? And so these are, you know, specific uh, tasks and specific um, objectives that most Web3 projects will go to to some extent if they're, you know, especially DAOs and, and being decentralized. And on my experience, potentially I'm wrong. Um, I haven't seen a tool that sort of encompasses all of that like membership aspect um, from a, a, for a specific for Web3 projects. I think Clarity would probably be the most similar one, um, but I, I don't have any other references on that. So that, that's I think the answer. Clarity.so. 
Okay. Let me get it Sorry. for you. I'm not sure okay. what the. Yeah, it's, it's, okay. it's okay. It's okay. Um, anyway, we can add that in the description. They don't know. Uh, Eyal, um, yeah, please, please go on. Yeah, Clary yeah, just said the he, last one. Um, I, I think the answer is definitely uh, there needs to be tools, um, the Web3 tools that, uh, that uh, do things that Web2 things do. Uh, for example, dispute resolution. You don't want to, um, if there is. Um, if there's a proposal that that is uh, in contention, you don't want to go to um, to a Swiss court for that uh, or any kind of other court. You want something that will be uh, a quick resolution to this uh, to this thing. So you have tools like Claris and uh, Aragon courts that do that, and you definitely want that to be online with with the ethos of the DAO ecosystem. So that the jurors uh, are being replaced all the time and. There's transparency and there's quickness um, and there's knowledge of, of what's going on, which is again, the ethos of the DAO ecosystem. And um, so you also want tools for uh, discussion like the Discord and Discourse are web two tools and they can take you down or they can censor you. So you want to be able to, uh, to do communications without any um, one, one uh, weak link like, link like this where the tool can take you down. And um, for example, if you think about, um, if you think about governance, uh, governance is a web two thing that is translated by the DAO ecosystem to web three. It's how we do governance now, uh, very different than, than how we did it in web two and we see the benefits from it. And, um, and treasury management is something that's used to be done by people for, for hundreds or thousands of years, and, and now we're doing it with Web3. So we do want all the supporting tools to be uh, Web3 versions as well, for sure. But, but I don't think we should over-index on that. I mean, it is great to be as decentralized as possible. And I think the idea of a DAO that can completely run in a decentralized, today, uh, decentralized way and has uh, all of its dependencies, including its tools decentralized, is, uh, is like a, a good aspiration to have. Uh, but I don't think it's necessarily possible to ever actually get there uh, because we all live in, we don't live on chain, right? And ultimately DAOs are humans. And so I think we should keep it in mind as a goal but not, uh, but not, not actually sacrifice uh, effectiveness to get there. Um, I also don't think we should disregard things that are web two or not technological at all uh, that are really important tools. For example, uh, like it or not, we live in the real world and the real world can come to us and that's why things like limitation of liability matters um, and why things like incorporating and having a legal structure matters, right? Because DAOs have to interoperate with the real world. Um, and so there are things that we should do as DAOs, which are not going to be Web3 um, and shouldn't be Web3. DAOs are yeah. the real world. Other than that, I agree with you. <laughs> Yeah, I always think of that. I love that. Um, I guess my only take, going back to Mike's comment, is that it. I, I agree with what you're saying, and I think it falls in a bit of a in a loop, right? Whereas, are we build our tools, and our tools build us, and definitely like up until we figure out sort of what we want to be building and why we need it and why, then probably those tools, those Web3 tools that you're mentioning would definitely impact our, how we run as well, which is what um, Al was saying, right? If we have Discord and Discord can censor us, then potentially that's a tool that's shaping how we're behaving. Um, and so thinking through those two is like integrated together, I think is, is beneficial to how we're structuring sort of the, the tooling moving forward. Yeah. Um, all right. Thanks, everyone. So we are almost out of time. I'm, I'm going to move to some uh, audience questions right now. Um, so, okay. This one is from Kathleen. 
do you think DAO tooling will also be adopted by traditional players to decentralize parts of their organization, given the pressure arising from the talent crisis and gig economy at large? Yes, I, I do. Uh, these are tools which are not just useful for uh, web for DAOs that are decentralized themselves. They can also be used for DAOs which call themselves LLCs and corporations or other types of businesses. Um, and uh, let's say you are a company that uh, is looking for talent and is willing to hire that talent from anywhere in the world, which many remote companies are, especially in a post-COVID world then paying them becomes a bit of a struggle. And it actually may make a lot of sense to pay them in crypto um, and uh, or keep funds in escrow so that you don't have to deal with jurisdictions around the world and you know that may not even have clear laws all the time. Um, and so I, I see no reason why centralized organizations um, wouldn't use tools that are developed for DAOs uh, to decentralize part of what they do. Yeah, I mean, to kind of tack on to that, I mean, I think it's, it's interesting talking about like DAO as the governance stack. I see on top of companies or organizations or even clubs, like the entity that you have to form for that. Like if you're just kind of getting together and it's like more a social org, that that's fine. But I mean, if you're going to be doing like events or doing kind of like larger things that interact with the physical world where you could have li liability. There's a reason why LLCs exist and there's a reason why these kind of uh, entity structures exist. So I think that's what's been interesting is some of these DAOs are like a multi-sig and some tokens and, and that's totally all well and fine. I think like as you start to get into existing companies, that's a lot of the conversation around that is like, what's my liability? Like who's signing this contract? Like how do I actually interface and like, you know, do business with other things that aren't necessarily DAOs or aren't just fine with kind of token swaps or, you know, kind of like some smart contract engagement. Um, so I think do, I think that a lot of companies are going to try to do DAOs. I think that it doesn't necessarily mesh um, with kind of their current corporate models. But I do think that if they did some kind of new entity that was helping kind of facilitate engagement with the community, um, that would be something that's really interesting. And so I do see like a component of that, but I don't necessarily think you're going to see all these C-Corps all of a sudden pivoting to like full DAO kind of community governance for day-to-day for -day decisions. So, yeah. Okay, um, another question comes from Twitter. So so this is from a bit DAO holder. Um, yeah, his name is like a, a long hello 982 something how, how do you avoid the abuse of power and be really become decentralized um it's very hard to uh, to avoid abuse of power um what, one way that we're trying to help that deep down is trying to help is by showing the power structure so if you go and and look at the um, at the members list and show uh, and, and see the how much power does each member have and what are they doing with their powers? Are they voting on all the proposals? Are they winning all the proposals? And ideally, uh, you'd want to see a, a power structure that is uh, distributed between uh, many members so that you know that there is a strong community there and not just one person. And... and um, uh, at least theoretically, if there is many people involved and you know who they are and they're, you're able to hold them accountable and, or, or at least know what they're doing, then at least theoretically, you'd avoid abuse of power by, in ways that we see now in, in, the, in that real world by dictators and, uh, and corrupt governance, governments. So yeah, in that's one a... word, it's a Being it's a really tough transparency. one. I it think is. transparency is that that probably is the word. Uh, yeah. You know, in in democracies, there's democracies that are not really democracies at all. Uh, you know, ninety eight percent of the vote goes one way, and there's democracies which are really robust and everything in between. And and I think it's it's a great question, and it's really important that we don't think because we call something a DAO, it's decentralized or distributed, uh, the, the mechanics and the checks and balances and the multi-sig structure 
and the you know, voting structure matters. Uh, and frankly, we're still trying to figure it out. Um, and so I, I think like that, that needs to be focused on first and foremost to ensure that governance is healthy uh, because all actions and assets event, you know, really flow from governance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I th I'd also add that it's honestly a bit of a spectrum, right? We tend to feel like, oh, is it decentralized or not? But it's not really that binary. You may be centralized in some front, more decentralized than others. And really thinking through how we're sort of adapting that um, makes sense. Because as we've organized uh, historically, we have been organized in a more centralized form, which, by the way, also has its benefits, right? You don't need to consult thousands of people in every tiny decision. Um, and so thinking what works best for some organizations and others, I think, is part of that experimentation that we're currently undergoing in the DAO ecosystem. Yeah, so like um, we are almost out of time, everyone. So like, thanks. Thanks to all our speakers. Yeah, I, I think I learned a lot from this uh, conversation. I, I think like we can wrap up with like one minute from each, each of you, like just maybe like summarizing some of your thoughts and then telling people where they can find you. Um, let's, let's start with Juliet. Yeah, sure. Um, so anyway, thanks again. It's been a super interesting discussion. I'd say if you're thinking of um, building projects, definitely, you know, hop into some Discord, tap into some DAOs, play with it a bit. There's a lot of uh, gaps to be wrapped around. And if I can provide any help um, from an arrogant side or just from an engineering side, please reach out. Um, I'm on Discord, on Twitter. I'll send out my information and you can definitely reach me out on both of those fronts. Yeah, um, uh, Sam? Yeah, just to echo Juliet's point on getting involved, I, I really strongly recommend just jumping into discords and trying to actually contribute. Don't just be a lurker. Try to do something, even if it's small. Um, the whole space is very permissionless. You can jump in and, and really provide value if you have the skill set. Um, if you have any questions at all about getting into Web3, also from a developer point of view, feel free to reach out to me on Discord. I'm Sam F with Superfluid. Um, I'll put my my uh, username in there just like Juliet did and you should also go check out superfluid as well um, at superfluid.finance okay uh, Eyal yeah so uh, jump on the discord seems to be our mantra today and I, and I joined that and I, I'd also say buy some tokens since I assume most of the people here are, are from crypto buy some tokens and go vote vote a couple of times you'll see for yourself how uh, easy it is to vote in uh, to participate to own a project to own a DAO in in web3 and how difficult it is to actually know and understand what's going on in governance so uh, I encourage everyone to vote and um, you can find me and you can find deep DAO on our site deepdao.io or at our discord server which uh, is linked from the site um, we're there. Come and chat with us about DAOs and ask questions and comment and tell us what you think. Uh, all right, Mark? If you'd like to reach out to us at Shipyard Software, we're the developers of Clipper.exchange. Join our Discord uh, and you can message me there. Um, you can also swap with the cheapest prices there. Um, you can also follow me on Twitter at Mark Lurie, uh, M-A-R-K-L-U-R-I-E. Um, and we'd love to have you participate in our, our governance um, as we as we launch that. Um, I also would like to ask your help um, with respect to sushi because sushi is perhaps the most uh, widely known DAO, and it's gone through some troubles. And I think what it needs is transparency. To Al's point, uh, and so uh, we're going to be uh, proposing making a governance proposal to essentially do an assessment and audit and bring transparency to Sushi so that the rest of the community can engage in voting. And so we'd love your support there on the Sushi forums um, to bring transparency. All right, uh, finally, John. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. Really, really enjoyed the conversation with everyone. Um, <clears throat> not to sound like a broken record, but I mean, I think that it kind of like shows you that this is probably the best path is like really getting involved, you know, like hopping in a Discord, finding something you're passionate about. There's DAOs for kind of every walk and you know interest, I think. So um, yeah, just jump in, participate. I can talk to you all day and we can talk about tools and what to do. But I think like really just actually going through the motions is just you know, infinitely better than, than listening to it. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it, 
you know, BitDAO uh, has a Discord, also has a discourse. Uh, it would love for you to get involved there. I'm fairly active. And then also uh, I'll link my Twitter. It's just Jonathan T. Allen one because it's a very uncommon name. So I had to have a few modifiers on it, but yeah. Uh, thanks for having me once again. All right. Uh, th thanks everyone. Yeah, I, I learned a lot from this conversation and uh, yeah, it gives me some ideas on how we can develop MoDAO as well. So for all of you who are not familiar with MoDAO, you can join our Discord. Uh, we are actually running a hackathon. So if you have any ideas on like DAO to link, like please submit. Uh, we have like three different tracks and the, the top prize wins uh, 30K. So, so there, there's no real... That there's no kind of strings attached. You, you just get 30k if you win win the prize. And, and um, yeah, so like thanks thanks to all of you for like listening in, and thanks to all the all the guests today. Um, yeah, so have a good day. It's like 3 a.m. right now, so I, I'm going to sleep soon. Good night. Thank you guys. Thank you for organizing. Thank you. Really appreciate yeah. it. Yeah. Thanks, Alvin. Bye. Yeah. yeah bye.